Hello, everyone. I'm um, very excited to be here today to get to speak a bit about one of my favorite topics, uh, the speed of mobile websites. So I'm an engineer, right? So I'm going to look at this from a very a bit of a technical perspective. It's not going to be too technical. I'm going to try to keep it soft. Um, but I'm going to speak a bit about you know, maybe JavaScript, maybe CSS, but it's stuff that you probably all have a little idea of um, how it works. And so as Kirk said, um, I do a lot of speed audits, right? Uh, probably not hundreds, actually, maybe a bit less, but still. And I usually do it in a very small setting. So we, I do my audits, we sit in a room with the marketing team, the, developer, the developers, and I go through my findings, and we have a good debate, a healthy debate. Everyone's happy, sometimes people get angry, and we just discuss. Um, there's a bit too much of you today to do it that way. So I did, I'm trying today something a bit different. And what I did is I wrote a little script uh, last week, and I did a speed test, or a couple of speed tests, over all your websites here today. So all the domains that you're representing today, uh, I've run a little you know, speed test over it. <laughs> yeah, I'm comfortably excited now. Um, but don't worry, no names. I'm going to aggregate everything. But before that, let's start by the beginning, right? Uh, the situation right now is that uh, smartphones are performance constrained. And that maybe doesn't sound obvious, but um, if you look at it, they're the most powerful personal computing devices we've ever had in our pockets. But on the other hand, they also have to load the most complex and heavy websites ever. And if you couple that to the fact that uh, users have much higher expectations on mobile because they compare mobile websites uh, to apps, and apps are, you know, they're native elements, so they're much faster and they're much more snappy usually. So their comparison level, you know, is very, comparison bar is already very high. And just to give you an idea, the average web page was um, 390 kilobytes in 2011. Uh, now it's more than tripled that size. And it's going exponentially. Websites are complex and they're bigger. And the direct result of this is that uh, mobile commerce is still right now an upper funnel affair. And what I mean by that, you're probably familiar with this, you know, conversion funnel where uh, users go through until the, they're going to purchase on your website. Uh, in a conversion funnel, and a typical one, there'll be about 2.6 different devices used. So they, people switch from one screen to the other, right? Uh, and usually, the conversion will happen on desktop at the end. There's a trust factor to this, right? A big trust factor. But also, there's a big uh, performance factor as well. And if your websites take more than 10 or 20 seconds to load, there's no way the user can actually enter this conversion funnel to start with in the beginning. And also, there's another interesting thing. On mobile screens uh, now, they're all touch-enabled, right? So you feel much more the latency when you press, and you have to wait before seeing the effect of that press uh, than on any other device. On a, even on desktop, even if a mouse is precise, when you scroll you know, the scrolling wheel, there's a bit of delay that you don't even see, whereas on mobile, you feel it much faster. Uh, I also like this quote a lot uh, from Reed Wright. It says that when you squeeze that web shopping experience into a mobile browser, the result is disaster, and the term that we all hate probably in this room is this abandoned shopping carts. So people just, they try, they persevere, but then it just doesn't work for them, so they will drop out of the conversion funnel. And that's terrible for us. Um, this poll is also interesting. Uh, it was made by Google, about 570 respondents. And what's interesting here is that nearly half of, uh, of the people answered that waiting for slow pages to load was their biggest pain point. Right? It's nearly as much as all the other categories summed up together. So that's pretty intense. And now, I want to take time to focus on this. Why would you care here in this room? Right? And there's two things I want to speak about. The first one is this. And this is a very big milestone that we've passed um, last year in November. And the overall web traffic at that date has surpassed, uh, the mobile traffic, sorry, has surpassed not only desktop, but has now stabilized at a, a steady 50%, which means that uh, potential, your potential customers have one chance out of two to engage with your brand first on mobile. You know, that's one out of two. It's very, very high. And then, so now we're entering this, uh, the first results of the speed test I did on your websites. And before showing the graph, and it's a bit of a scary graph, so I'm going to explain the methodology. And I ran something called the PageSpeed, uh, PageSpeed Insights score on it. And what it, it's a Google-made thing, and you can test it out uh, on your own website. It's free, and I'll probably manage so the link is sent into your uh, thank you emails after this event. 
What it does is it measures different optimization aspects, and then it gives a score on how optimized your website is or is not. And it's a score from zero to 100, and our best practice uh, is above 85. And this is what it looks like for this room right now. Right? 93% of the websites here today are under the 80 bar. And what that means is that 93% of the websites may not be ready. So I use conditional here, because it's not an absolute value, right? It's not an absolute measure. There's other things that come into account. So that's a bit scary, right? And I'm really sorry that I have to show you the bad news so early in the event. I don't want to depress you, uh, <laughs> but the good news is there's tons of low-hanging fruits, and I'm gonna speak about them a bit more um, just now. Yeah, because winning in mobile is very possible. And we spoke about Amazon already, uh, Kirk mentioned it, but they are an example of, uh, of a company that's winning in it. And the, the reason they are so performant is uh, because they made it part of their culture. So they decided to optimize for what they call the critical action, right? And the critical action is the most important things that users have to do on your website to generate success for you. And success could mean more conversions, more revenue, uh, downloads of a certain thing, a sign up for leads or for an insurance product, you know, it's lots of different things. Uh, at Google, we call this the critical user journey, right? And we try to optimize all our products for that specific step. And their critical user journey was to be able to come from, I want this thing, to I bought this thing in under 30 seconds. And when you think about it, it's quite impressive, right? Uh, imagine if you compare that to the offline world. If you're sitting in your couch and you want something, you have to get up, you have to go put your shoes on, you have to lace your shoes. And then you've probably hit 30 seconds. You haven't even opened the door out of your house. Whereas if you're on mobile uh, with Amazon, you can stay on your couch. You don't, even, you don't even have to put pants on. It's not required for this specific process. And you can go from I want to I bought in 30 seconds. And they, so this line is unfortunate here, but the fact that it's underneath this uh, is a measure that they did. And they noticed that when they decreased the loading time by 100 milliseconds, the overall revenue of Amazon grew by 1%. And this is Amazon, right? So 1% more revenue for Amazon is massive. It's huge. So, what is performance? It's a, probably a good time now to speak about what you should aim for. And this uh, very, very recent study, I think this was released in February this year, so it's really fresh. And it's very interesting because it uses a bit of uh, you know, a fancy new piece of tech that you may have heard about a lot recently. And what they did here is they, fe they fed a deep neural network, so that's machine learning area right there. They fed it with nearly a billion uh, user, mobile user sessions. And there was lots of other dimensions across these sessions, you know, like the, the settings of the browser, the location, like all these things. And they asked the neural network to predict uh, or to find the highest correlation between any of the dimension, and uh, the bounce rate. And what they found is that there's a, what the neural network found is that there's a direct correlation between the two. And it's actually quite huge, you know, from, if you go from one second to three seconds loading time, your probability of bouncing, or the probability of the user to bounce, increases uh, by 32%. And if you go down to the difference between one and 10 seconds, it more than doubles. So there's a real um, relation between the two. And another study found that 53%, and you're gonna hear this probably a lot during the event, that 50, um, in average, 53% of users will bounce after a three second loading time, right? Three second, that's really low. And we'll see later how many of you fall into three seconds. Um, but I wanna show you this first. It's a big graph, I know, but what's shown here, on the bottom you have the loading time, conversion rates in red, and amount of sessions in blue. And this was made on uh, 4.5 million uh, mobile sessions from a, for a big retailer in the US. Uh, and they found this interesting correlation between the conversion rate and the loading time. And as you can see, around 2.4 seconds, they have their peak of uh, 1.9 conversion rates. And this is on mobile. So 1.9% conversion rate on mobile is really nothing to be ashamed of. The average for uh, desktop is between 2 and 3% for retail in the US. So that's really close to the desktop conversion rate. So you can actually convert on mobile if you do it uh, properly. And what you see also here is that the difference in conversion rate between two and three second, or 2.5 and, and 3.5, is about 27% uh, increase in the conversion rate. So there is a correlation between loading time and your conversion rate. There's also this interesting uh, 
very low conversion rate in the beginning of the graph. And we're not totally sure, but we think it's because of uh, 404 error pages. So 404, page not found, that kind of stuff. So of course it loads very fast, but you cannot convert, hence the low conversion rates. So I hope now you're starting to see that, you know, and I think that's the biggest thing I want you to take uh, back from this presentation. Page speed equal revenue. It's just that simple. But now you may be wondering, what is a good load time? What should you aim for? And so I'll give you the, the pain right now. Uh, the advice of Google is one second. So you should load in less than one second, right? And that's scary. And that's regardless of the network, because the loading time is a perception thing from the user. It does, they don't care if they're on 3G, 4G, LT, Edge, whatever. They just want it to load fast. And one second is really how you make it snappy and how you get them to engage much, much better. Um, and that's also confirmed by big actors like Amazon. And I really like this quote from Jeff Bezos, who says that uh, to get, you don't get to where it needs to be without a lot of pain. Let me give you the pain up front. The target is one second. And the interesting thing here is both the one second again, but also the name, uh, the word pain, which he repeats twice. So to get there, it's going to be a painful process, right? Painful in the sense that you'll have to make decisions which are gonna to lead to compromises on other areas like design, you know, or animations. And that's gonna be hard decisions. You're gonna have debates about this internally. But it's important, as we saw. And I also like this quote from Jeremy, um, who's a conversion expert. And he says that if your website loads between one and two seconds, that's good. Above uh, three to six, it's average. Seven to 10, it's poor. And 10 seconds, I'm very, very sorry. And I'm also very, very sorry for your users if you're above 10 seconds. We saw with, when we tested with uh, Google Home before, it's painful to watch something, or to watch nothing in this case for, not, for 10 seconds. Now let's see a bit how you guys, you know, stack compared to this. And this is the amount of websites that fall into each of the categories today. And well, there's 11 websites that load in less than two seconds in this room. That's really impressive. I don't know who you are, but you can feel very proud right now. Um, Three to six, 62, that's way more, right? We have this big gap right there. Uh, good news for these guys is that they're, you're really close to the three second milestone. So there's probably a couple of low hanging fruits you can leverage to get to the three second. Uh, seven to 10, you have even more uh, low hanging fruits, I guess. 10 plus, well, uh, pff, I'm very, very sorry for you guys. <laughs> but good news is you probably have small things you can implement in a matter of hours that will get you into the category above. But now, um, we spoke about problems, let's start speaking about solutions. And I'm gonna tell you about a bit of uh, usual suspects, the, the main pain points that I see when I do my audits. But before that, I, keep, I want you to keep this in mind. Remember, our target is one second, right? It's a very ambitious, scary target of one second. But when you use a 3G connection, you actually have an overhead uh, from the network and you can't do much about it. And that overhead, in terms of milliseconds, is about 60%. So just right now, with that target, I just took out 60% of the available time for you uh, to get that one second. That's kind of scary, right? And that means you only have 400 milliseconds uh, with that same target to handle server and client-side connections. That's extremely low. Um, now, the good news is, uh, I say mobile pages should render in less than one second, but it doesn't need to load all the page, right? You know, you have this concept of above the fold, and above the fold is what you, what user sees at a certain time on the screen. It's the first thing they'll see. What's underneath the, 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 the scroll, they'll have to actually scroll down to see it. But you can load that stuff later on, and I'll tell you how you can do this in a second. And so this brings me to my first suspect, uh, non-optimized images, right? And the reason this is so important is because uh, according to HTTP Archive, which is a website that measures um, gather stats basically on I think the 300,000 biggest websites in the world, uh, according to the, the Alexa rank, and it gets you know average uh, measures on lots of different things. And they measured that 67% of the average web page is actually images, right? That's two thirds, so that's a huge area for improvement. But you may tell me now like, okay, but this probably includes Instagram or image boards, you know, stuff that's very uh, content heavy and we're e-commerce people, we're serious people. Uh, we don't have as much images. And you're right, in this room, in average, you have 40% of images on your websites. So yeah, it's less than the two thirds, but 40% sounds to me like a great area to explore. And the good thing is, it's quite easy to optimize this. 
And my best practice here, the way I usually uh, I would do it myself, basically, is I would start with a one-off compression tool, stuff like uh, Image Optim on Mac. It's, a, it's these simple tools where you just drag and drop your images in there, and it gives you how, many, how much savings you can get in percents by compressing your image with a lossless compression, meaning that they'll look just as good as before, but they'll just be less heavy. And there's tons of things, um, tons of areas of the image you can play on that will not degrade the quality, but they will reduce the size. And then if you're happy with the compression, you can make it part of your build workflow. And so for the non-technical minded people amongst us, the build workflow is the set of automated steps that you follow between the development of your websites and when you push it to the server to be used by live users. Uh, and you can make image compression part of that. So we'll automatically compress images when you deploy it to your server and you don't even need to care about it. It's just, it's done for you right away. So that's really interesting. And then you can use stuff like lazy loading. And lazy loading is the, uh, is the co concept I started to speak about earlier. It's you can load things just when they're needed, right? You don't need to load all the images on the page right away. You can load only the ones that are above the fold and load the other ones later on. So you lazy loading, you put a little placeholder there and then later on the script will populate it. And even if this sounds complex, it's actually not. There's tons of tools and libraries that you can use to implement this uh, in a very low amount of time. And then the download and hide and download and shrink. Those are very common if you're using a responsive design uh, website. You know these websites where you, when you narrow the width, all the elements rearrange or some disappear and all that? Um, a common pitfall when using that is to use something called download and hide. And that means uh, if you're on mobile, you, you load the same stuff as you would load on desktop, but you hide some elements. So you're actually downloading things that you're not gonna show, and that's a waste of time, and a waste of bandwidth, and then a waste of loading time. And so this analysis is quite interesting as well. It was made uh, by Google, and they analyzed um, the landing pages of AdWords campaigns for a couple thousand of websites, I think. And they found that 30% of those pages uh, could compress images and save, in average, 250 kilobytes. And that doesn't sound like much, right? But that's 1.25 seconds to download that on a fast 3G connection. And that's a connection at 1.6, uh, I think, megabit per second. So that's kind of a fast 3G. And that brings me um, to my second suspect, the non-minified resources. So you probably know that your websites or most websites are made of HTML uh, for the structure, CSS for the styling, JavaScript for the cool you know, um, activities, intelligence, um, and then images. Well, in this room, I measured this. In average, we have like a small amount of HTML that's expected, a bit more CSS also expected, Lots of images, of course, but then we have more JavaScript than we actually have images. And that was kind of a surprise to me. Um, but when you think a bit more about it, it's not that much of a surprise, right? Where uh, your e-commerce uh, websites, e-commerce companies, what you're doing is complex. You have a lot of tracking on your websites. You have a lot of uh, customization to the user. Uh, you have to verify you know, inventory levels, delivery options, all these things live. So that's why there's so much complexity. And the good news is there's very easy ways to reduce this by up to 70%, again. Um, and the most common one is gzip. And you're probably all using gzip right now because it's kind of industry standard. And it's just a method to compress files when you send them from the server to the, to the mobile phone. It's really effective. It can compress up to 90% any type of file. Um, and then minification. So that's a bit more technical, but basically what it means is that if you have, a, let's say, a JavaScript file and you're a developer, when you write it, you make it look pretty so it's easy to read. And that, mean, that means you have spaces, you indent, uh, you use comments uh, that's, so that the next developer can understand what this function does. But all these things are useless um, for the JavaScript engine that's actually gonna read through it and show the stuff on the website. He doesn't need to know, it's a machine, right? So he, what you can do with minifying is remove all spaces, all tab characters, uh, all comments. You can even rename stuff to have uh, shorter names so that the file is, the file's weight is actually much smaller. And you can even take these files and append them together when you minify them so that it's only one file to download instead of multiple. And that way you can get lots and lots of savings. Uh, and then refactoring is also one, and that's more of an ongoing thing, you know, when you add new features, you add new styles uh, in CSS, for example, and over time it can get a bit uh, bloated, so that's the, you know, best practice of just cleaning it over time. And like if you think about this, right? I showed on the previous slide that we had, um, 
we have about two megabytes of compressible resources. So that's HTML, CSS, and images. Uh, sorry, and JavaScript. Um, and if we compress these by 70% uh, here, that's a whopping 1.43 megabytes that you save for each page. And 1.43 megabytes on Fiji connection, that's seven seconds loading time. Right? That's massive, that's huge. Um, but you will probably won't get this. Uh, don't, don't dream too much. You won't get the seven seconds just like that by using these things. You're pretty advanced players here in this room, I expect. You're probably using lots of them already. Don't go see your developer, uh, developer team tomorrow and say like, we need these things, and they'll be like, we have these things. <laughs> so, but it's areas, you know, that you can investigate. Now, the next one are too many requests. And you know, to, to fetch all these resources, JavaScript, HTML, CSS images, each one is a request that you make. And so if you have too many, um, you have this overhead from the network, you know, this 600 milliseconds. So 600 milliseconds is an average. Uh, usually it's, it's about 250 milliseconds to do a round trip over a, a 3G network. And again, HTTP archive measured that 68% of websites on the web do more than 50, uh, load more than 50 resources. And 50, it's not uh, a random number, it's the best practice that Google advise uh, in terms of number of resources. And so in this room, again, we have actually 74% of resources. I blame that mostly on uh, JavaScript files because you have so many of them. Um, but again, there's ways to optimize this very easily. So you could do, this is a bit more technical, but you could leverage what we call the user browser's cache. So every browser has a local cache in which he can keep files for a certain amount of time, so he doesn't need to download them again. And that's why, you know, a returning visit to websites is much faster than a first-time visit on a website. But you can, you as website creator, you can decide how long the file will stay in the cache and which files can stay in the cache. So if you play your cards correctly there, you can have a ton of content that will be just from the user phone and no resources, no RAM trips would be required to load them. That's actually quite interesting. Now consolidate the page resources. I mentioned that just before, you know, if you, when you minified your files, for example, you could just append them together to make one big file and then you're loading one resource instead of loading five different ones at once. And that's also a way to avoid the round trip. And then, so the two ones uh, underneath are also quite interesting. It's the whole concept of loading first what the user will actually see. And if you look at that image there on the left, uh, what is on the screen is above the fold. The fold is the bottom of the screen, uh, for those who don't know this concept. And so what's above the fold is what's shown on, on the phone right now. What's underneath is beneath the fold. And you should load in one second, you know, or a few seconds if you can manage it, what's above the fold first. That's what the user will see first, and he will feel the website is complete once that area has loaded. And so to do that, you can load stuff later, right? So you could load first the styling of only what's above the fold. There's very easy ways to do that. But also only load resources that are required for the above the fold content, and then do the rest later so that this will show very fast, and then the rest will show a bit uh, further down. Um, there's also one thing, I didn't speak about it here, but I think also you should avoid putting too much, um, you know, this fancy JavaScript libraries that everyone speaks about, on the, every developer speaks about at least on the web now. There's always a new JavaScript framework that you have to use, and I would advise to stay away from them as much as possible. If you can do it with plain old JavaScript, there's no need to have this fancy framework, even though your neighbor is going to tell you that you need this to be in, in this new world. And I don't think it's the case. Now, the next one, and my last one, actually, are the redirections. And this is especially important for if you're doing AdWords advertising, because a click on a Google Ads is actually, on search, for example, is actually a redirection to your website. So that's one first redirection. Uh, but then, you could have more redirections afterwards. And I'm going to ex explain this a bit more. I put this timer down there on the what, zero to three seconds. I like three seconds because you know this stat says that after three seconds, 53% uh, of users will bounce. Um, and so let's see how it will work out. You know, if the user makes a demand for uh, or tries to load example.com, that will first be a DNS lookup, and DNS lookup is. Um, uh, a lookup to see what's the IP address of this domain to know where to fetch the files from the server. So first a DNS lookup, then establish a connection, then download the data. But now, uh, example.com is gonna say, hey, you're on the mobile. Maybe you should be served by my m.example.com version of the website. That's another DNS lookup, that's another connection, that's another download of data. 
So now, with you know, taking into account the, over, the overhead from the network, you're nearly at two seconds there, but you haven't shown anything on your screen. The user is still watching a blank screen. Um, so it's a loss of time. And now in the worst case, imagine that m.example.com says, hmm, maybe I should show you my product page first. So this time there's no, connect, no DNS lookup because it's the same server, but there's still a connection and a download of data. So you're getting very close to those three seconds, that limits, and you haven't showed anything on the website yet. And so my recommendation for this is really that you should have served this right away. So if you're doing advertising campaigns, make sure your landing pages are the last step and not a certain flow that will redirect there. Um, responsive designs, for example, do this, responsive websites do this very well because they have one uh, example on for example, their one domain will serve all the different screen sizes. So they don't need to redirect at all. So that's a good practice to use. Now, getting to the end of this, um, if you have to remember only one thing about what I said today, and I spoke about technical stuff, I spoke about best practices, so you, you'll probably forget this when you, when you leave the room, but I want you to remember this. I want you to, co to try to consider that um, mobile site speed should be a feature, right? It should be considered as a feature, and it's actually quite easy to do because it's a very profitable feature. I showed you in the beginning, uh, there's tons of uh, incremental conversions to get tons of incremental revenue to get just by optimizing your site speed. And I showed you some low-hanging fruits before. For nearly everything that I spoke about, we're not speaking months of developments. We're usually speaking weeks, right? It, it's actually quite fast to get there. And the further you are from this target of three or one second, then the more opportunities you have to actually get them implemented soon and to get the cool returns. And if I move a bit, you can see that lots of companies have done experiments on this. Google has uh, identified that if it was 2% faster, and he did a test on that by removing some unnecessary things. Well, actually, they were necessary, but not very used. They got 2% more searches. Um, Amazon, again, we said 100 milliseconds faster, 1% more revenue, and so on and so forth. So now, when you go back after this event, what I would advise to do is sit, to sit together with your dev team, if you can, um, and try to see how you can make speed a feature and allocate budget to it and just try to make it part of your roadmap. And on that, I want to thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, probably doesn't surprise you got some questions. Um, uh, this is where my lack of uh, any expertise in this field is exposed because some of these questions I, I don't even quite understand. So, um, so, but I'm gonna, but at least you know that I am not auditing the questions that you're asking. So, uh, so most popular question is, um, why did you run it on the Page Speed Insights tool? Current technologies like HTTP2 are completely ignored in Page Speed, and those practices are penalized instead. Yeah, it's a very good question. So, Page Speed Insights is one of the measurement tools built by Google. Uh, it was built a couple of years ago, I think. I saw it as early as 2012, 2012. Um, I found it simplistic because uh, it measures, you know, it measures the, the most obvious things, but it doesn't give the full picture. For example, it won't measure the actual loading time. And for a good reason, because it's very, very hard to actually measure, uh, using a machine, measure a loading time, because, you know, what is a loaded page? Is it when you've downloaded everything and then rendered everything uh, and then, you know, showed all the images? Can you consider that the loading page? I don't think that's correct, because you can start using the page before everything is actually loaded. Um, what I use to measure your uh, loading times actually is a, web, uh, a website called webpagetest.org, which specializes in this kind of thing, and they actually run the test on phones. So they have a data center, it's full of mobile phones, and you request a test and they do it in their background, and they actually film the screen, and um, what they do is they wait for the screen to, be, to, stop, um, to stop moving, so you know, stop loading things, to consider the page loaded, and that's much more efficient. So the bottom line is, is basically that it's good to start with PageSpeed Insights. It's a good, you know, it's a, it's a good overview and the score is quite handy to compare to, you know, competitors or, uh, or just to see how you're doing over time. Plus it has an API, so it's very easy to do at scale, which for my case here, there's 200 and 221 websites in this room today. So I needed something, I'm not gonna do it manually, right? I use an API. Um, so that's a good starting point, but then some Companies specialize in doing this. Uh, webpagetest.org is great also to measure over time. And then, you know, 
there's tons of uh, resources also on, I think, the Google developers' websites. So I hope that answered more or less your question, whoever it was. All good. Uh, any questions from the audience? Give me an opportunity to test my throwing arm again. Anything else? All good. We, I did say we would be limited by time. I'm going to throw this question in. I hope this can be a quick, um, uh, a quick answer. Uh, which, so what have we got here? Well, there's a few. So would you rather consolidate frameworks, JS, or use CDN? More resources problem. Right. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, more distributed resources or more aggregated ones? Um, <laughs> I'm afraid there's no good answer to that. <laughs> Um, there, next question. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason is, yeah, all websites are different, right? They're all made different. They have different objectives. And you're optimizing towards different things because you're in different industries. And that's just, you know, we spoke about div diversity in this office. I think websites are a form of diversity by themselves. And um, that's why there's no one-fit-all solution. And for me, the best way to do is to test. You know, run a little A-B test uh, on a small amount of traffic measure the results and measure, you know, measure correctly, measure what the user perceives and not just uh, times and you know, um, machine-generated uh, measures. Uh, I mean, measure perception more than just performance, I mean. Uh, and then you know, try both and see what fits best. And there's going to be different solutions to different problems. And, and I, think, I really think testing is the way to go. Awesome. We'll stop it there. Folks, please, uh, your thanks to Guillaume. <laughs>